everybody, Darren Voros here. Today, I'm here with Edna Keep, and we're going to be talking all about multifamily investing, both here in Canada and in the United States. Before we get into it with Edna, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get in there. Hey, Edna, thanks so much for being here and taking some time out of your day to join me and talk all about multifamily investing. Why don't you give everyone a bit of an, um, an overview of what you do as a real estate investor, uh, a teacher, a trainer, and everything else that you do in this space? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Darren. It's my pleasure to uh, be on your podcast. Um, well, you know what? We started in 2007. Of course, like everybody, we started with single family homes because we didn't even, uh, we, we just weren't taught that there was another option. And um, then, then we bought our first 24 unit, I think within 18 months of starting. And then it was like, holy cow, that just opened our eyes to what was actually possible. And, uh, and we, we bought it 24 units, 75,000 a door. So you know what the prices were then. We wish now we would have just kept it. Although our, uh, our realtor talked us into uh, converting it into uh, condos and selling it out, which is what we ended up doing. Um, but we wish we would have kept that one. And, and since then, we've grown to 600 doors and another 178 under contract in the U.S. right now. Uh, so yeah, we've we've done well with it. Uh, I, I teach and train people uh, the system we use to do the same thing. And uh, I love it. I love uh, the whole real estate game. And I love being able to share what we've learned with other people. How would you say is was the what was the transition like going from, you know, those single families to the multifamily? And I know that's a question for many people. How how do they transition from thinking bigger? Maybe that's just it. It's a part of mindset, but it's also like, you know, what do those transactions look like when you start to get into bigger properties? Are they the same amount of work? Are they, you know, are they harder? Are they easier? I think there's so many questions around there. But start with how you started that transition from single family to multifamily. We were sitting in a realtor's office one day and I was telling him our goal. So our goal, Rob, I said, we want to buy uh, 12 houses this year. And we have to do them, of course, through joint venture partnerships because uh, we can't qualify for mortgages anymore. And he said, Edna, if you're going to buy that many, why don't you just buy a multifamily? I said, oh, I can't do a multifamily yet. I don't own enough houses. You know, it's kind of like that monopoly mentality. You got to buy so many houses before you can buy a hotel. And, and that's honestly what I thought. I didn't realize that we could go straight into multifamily. And he said, no, no. He said, you, you could. And I said, really? We, we would be able to? And he said, yeah, I've gotten to know you. Your, your net worth is good. Your income's good. Uh, you know, he said, it's just a, just a different way of thinking. And I said, okay, what do you got? He said, well, I happen to have a 24 unit on my desk that he said, yeah, I haven't even uh, uh, listed it yet. He said, it's going to go on MLS tomorrow. Um, so I said to him, okay. And he, so he told me more and, uh, and then that's when he actually started talking about the condo conversion because he'd done some of them, some of them himself. And um, I said, okay, write it up. And he said, okay. And he said, do you want to go look by it? And I said, I thought you told me I didn't have to look at it. It's all based <laughs> on the numbers. And he said, well, it is. But you know what? It said it's right close here. Why don't, you, why don't you go drive by while I write up the paperwork? So I did. And I came back, signed the paperwork, put the offer in, and we got it accepted. And I said to him, because we really didn't know. I said, what kind of offer is it going to take to buy it? And he said, it's going to take full price offer. We were in a really hot market at that time. Mm -hmm. He said, it's going to take full price offer. So we offered, they asked 1.8 million. We, we bought it for 1.8 million. And, and then we just took on the learning curve, you know, um, he was very good. He'd already owned apartment buildings himself. Uh, so he really helped us through the whole process. Um, we partnered up with another couple who, uh, were property managers because that was something that always scared us like you know property management we we're kind of scared of that part uh and basically just phoned them up and said hey uh if we bought a 24 unit apartment building would you be our partner and and they said absolutely and that was how we got our first deal done nice and you you bought that in canada i'm assuming yeah right in regina saskatchewan yeah yeah, yeah. And, and is that where you kind of stayed for a little while? You stayed in, in Canada in, in multifamily? And then is that when you branched out to the U.S. was after that? We just recently branched out into the U.S. In the spring was our first, well, I shouldn't say our first purchase. We had bought a while like way back. I don't even remember when, 2008, 2009. Uh, my partner and I bought a 24 unit in Indi Indi Indiana uh, on by auction on a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, you know, kind of the reason we did that is just one of the things that uh, the rich dad 
group had talked about and, and we were kind of on a quest to do learn as much as we could as quickly as possible. I didn't end up staying in that deal. Um, we partnered with a couple who were from that area and they ended up with the deal, but that's that, that was our kind of our, our, one of our first ones in the US. We didn't, our, our biggest challenge at the beginning, Darren, was we couldn't get financing in the US because, you know, we started in 07, 08, 09, and it was 08, 09 that we were uh, traveling to the US quite a bit trying to find something, even houses. But because uh, of all the uh, crap that was going on in the markets and it was impossible to get financing. And for us, we needed to have financing. So uh, we, we uh, bought most of our properties in Saskatchewan. And then we bought, we bought something in Alberta. We've, we're right now in a building project, building a brand new 18 unit in uh, Alberta. Um, but the majority of our stuff is throughout Saskatchewan. Our investors were here. Our team members were all here. And, you know, we, Frank, went through a really, really good market uh, in the time when we were purchasing. Um, uh, not, not a great market to purchase in right now, uh, but uh, I have students purchasing, but they're finding some really, really good deals. Like deals that we bought back in uh, 2010, 2011, they're getting the same pricing we did back then, just to kind of give you an idea. Mm. So uh, still some stuff happening here, but we've chosen to focus on the U.S. Uh, I've got two partners one that's living down there right now and another one that's uh, talking about moving because we got another 178 unit under contract uh, just just lately. Um, but we started doing some research. Actually, the one partner did, he was working for another REIT in Canada, Canadian REIT, and he was their buyer. And he was uh, finding deals in Memphis, Tennessee. And the REIT, and as all REITs do, they have a uh, there's only so many properties you can buy in one area in a REIT. Like there's stipulations that you have. And the group he was buying for was past their limit or at their limit. And so he said, you know, I'm still finding all these great deals. And he approached me and the other partner and said, would you guys like to partner with me on this? Because I, I just am finding amazing deals and, and uh, I don't want to let them go. So we said, absolutely. And his first purchase down there was at 20,000 a door. 20,000 a door. And we had to put in probably 10, $12,000 a door to fix it up because it was just, you know, a tired landlord. He wasn't looking after stuff. And, uh, and so we took possession last spring and it, it, we're, we're just, we've got most of the work done in there and we're starting to fill it. And we had uh, projected that we'd get about 600 a door rent and we're actually getting 699. So it's going to be worth even more than what we expected. Um, and, uh, then and now just got 170, 178 units under contract at 21 six a door. Uh, same sort of thing. I think he said um, that works out to $28 a square foot and it's going to cost us about 1600 a square foot to renovate. And right now the uh, market rate for buildings like that that are all fixed up are, uh, you know, be, between high high. 50s to six mid 60s uh, for selling price. So that's kind of our, our take on that. Yeah, you look at those numbers, you know, when you're looking at uh, buying at 21,000, even if you spent 15,000 on a reno, you're in for 35. And I'm guessing if you're renting somewhere in that five or $600 a month range, you're way past that 1% rule. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's really, really excellent. And you know, the what we're targeting is workforce housing. So there's nothing fancy about these units at all. Mm -hmm. Like they're just bare bones, basic. Uh, I mean, you make them as nice as you can, but they're 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 not anything fancy. It's it's workforce housing that we're keying in on, and we think that that's the way of the future. And, and the other thing that we found out just recently is Donald Trump's group actually just bought, I can't remember if it was 30 or 130 million, it was in the, in the news, um, million dollars worth of real estate right in Memphis too. So that kind of tells you another, you know, we really hit the nail on the head buying there as well. When you started looking at multifamily, when you first started out, the biggest question I get is, you know, how do we get connected with these multifamily brokers or people that are dealing in multifamily? Because it is a, would you say it's a different group than on the residential side? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, is we, like we buy very, very few of our properties through MLS. Most of them are uh, uh, just people reaching out to us to share a deal. Cause you know, you start to get known as somebody who buys and there's certain things you have to do to get known to be that person. And deals just start coming to you. Like we get more deals than, than we can close on. And that I think is really key. The biggest thing, you know, with apartment buildings, nobody wants a sign on their front door saying for sale. 
because yeah. they do not want their tenants disturbed. As a matter of fact, when they finally do let you into the building, once you have it under contract to look at it, they're telling you, hey, you're the maintenance guy. You're the cleaning lady. You're not going to be the owner. Like you don't mm -hmm. do that. And yeah. that's one of the biggest things to wrap your head around because um, the, people do not want that. They don't want their tenants disturbed. They want to keep those same tenants. They, they've worked hard to keep them. They don't want anything happening to them. Um, so if, if people are, are paying attention to that, uh, the MLS, you know, like, you know, other people will see that their building is for sale because it, it is the sign that goes up. Yeah. You mentioned financing and uh, especially in the U.S., you said you struggled with that in 2008, 2009. What, what has changed now in 2021 for financing in the U.S.? Or is it just simply a matter of the fact that you have a higher net worth and it's easier to qualify? Higher net worth, we're dealing only with accredited investors. So uh, we've paid cash for the properties and the, uh, and the renovation so far. But again, my team members down there are talking to potential lenders already to get it lined up to be able to, uh, to fund it after. And the biggest thing too is we've got experience and, and we've been doing it for longer. And the States is in a much better position now than they were back in 08, 09. Like they're, they're not scared of financing like they were back then. Uh, mm. So those, those few things. And, and just it, for us, just having the confidence, I think, to go after si things that size. Like when we first started, Darren, we only wanted turnkey properties because we didn't have the capacity to do all the renovations. So um, everybody or lots of people I know like to buy the so they can fix it up and 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 refinance and pull the cash out. But that wasn't our concept. We wanted uh, stuff that was turnkey so we could own it and just operate it as is. Uh, we didn't want to have to spend a lot of time renovating and and all that sort of thing. We wanted to be able to finance it. We get a lot of um, uh, CMHC insured financing. So 15% down, we get a lot of vendor financing, uh, again, key with uh, certain buyers, and, uh, and then uh, investor capital from there. You actually stay pretty compartmentalized in what you do. Um, you don't actually try to manage buildings and try to manage people like that. You actually have operating partners, is that correct? And you yes. stay more on the capital raising side? Yeah. Yeah, that's been my background was as a financial advisor. That was kind of what the, I started noticing really early on that that part was easy for me. And for a lot of other people, it just wasn't like I had, I've had many partners come right from the original training we did and they could find deals, they could find properties, they could run them all day long, but they could never find the money. And mm -hmm. I realized very early on that I didn't like running the buildings. I didn't like the day-to-day -day work that goes with operating a building. I, and, and I think um, in any business, you've got to work within your strengths. And that's another thing that I really focus with my students on is, you know, you want to build your vision. What do you want to do? Not, not just what do you have to do? What does everybody else want you to do? But what do you want to do? And you won't always know when you first start your sweet spot. Um, but the more you can stay in your sweet spot, you know, I always said rather own 25% of four buildings than 100% of one. Uh, as long as I never have to do the day-to-day -day management of it. So yeah, finding your sweet spot is really, really important. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a great point, you know, and just because I think a lot of investors when they're getting into, you know, specifically maybe multifamily because they're so used to, if they're buying a single family dwelling and I like your philosophy of kind of saying, you don't necessarily always have to be doing it all, especially when you get to these bigger transactions, focus on, you know, are you a good uh, capital raiser, then focus on that. Are you a good operator? Then focus on that. Because I know that multifamily, there's enough to go around generally with these transactions where you can bring in people that are really good at what they do and you stick to what you're, what you're good at doing for sure. What do you think is the, um, the, the, the thing that holds most people back from moving into this space? You know what? You just said it actually, Darren. Most people get stuck on managing their own deals and they don't have any room to grow. So people will have three or four deals, they're dealing with tenants or dealing with toilets or dealing with financing, they're dealing with insurance and da, 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 da. You get four of those on the go, you're done, dead in the water if you're doing everything. You can't even, you can't even think about growing. And if you think about it, it's like, oh yeah, eventually when things slow down, I'll, I'll grow. So that was, again, one of the things that we picked on very early. We would go back to our 
you know, where we initially took our training, they'd have annual conventions and stuff. And people would say, wow, how'd you grow so fast? We had 50 doors in 18 months. And, you know, just after comparing notes and stuff, that's what I realized why we were able to grow. First of all, we didn't uh, ever get involved in the property management side ever. Uh, still don't like that side to this day. And we focused on our expertise, which was raising the capital. And, uh, and partnering with the people who wanted to do all the rest. And so many people think that they have to do everything. And it's kind of the way we're taught, really. You know, you're, you're kind of taught to rely on yourself. Nobody else is as good as you are, all that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, that, that's the biggest thing. You own four doors, you, you do all that work. Yeah, it saves you a little bit of money, but what's the cost? What's the cost really of not being able to grow into somebody who could own like, you know, 178 doors, say, for example, I haven't even looked at those buildings, I just get all the, you know, reports on it and the pictures and the videos and I talk to my partners, and then I talk to potential investors, and and then it goes from there and that's my only job I don't have to look at the building I don't have to decide on paint colors I don't have to decide on flooring like totally out of my realm. Mm. Yeah, and I think that you know I'm reading a book right now it's called who not how. And it's that exact same philosophy, right? It, you know, if you're doing everything, you can't, you don't have the time to, to do it. And I struggled with this and I still struggle with it as an investor, because I think like, if you're going to do something, you, you should know how to do it. Well, that's not necessarily the case because it doesn't allow you to scale your business and grow. The other part too, Darren, on top of that is most people think they need to know the how in order to even set a big goal. I need to know how you do that. And they think it's all strategy. But you know, a very, very high percentage of it is uh, what goes on between your ears and its mindset. Because if you think you can, you can. And if you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> you know, and so that that's the first thing people have to uh, get their head around. What is your biggest piece of advice for people that want to get into the multifamily space? What's the first thing they need to do to get started? They need a mentor because there's so many things in multifamily. And when you're dealing with that kind of money, you can't afford to make a mistake. You absolutely can't afford to make a mistake because uh, a, a mistake like that can be really big. Like I just imagine the 178 units we're buying in Memphis right now at 22,000 uh, 22, a door. It's 30% vacant. Well, why? You know what I mean? Uh, and somebody got in over their head. So you need to know what you don't know, first of all, strategy. And then you need to stay around like-minded people uh, to you know, make sure that you understand not just how to buy it, but how to run it effectively and make sure that it's going to be a good long-term investment for you and your investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great advice. Uh, Edna, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to, to join us and talk about multifamily investing, about what you do as an investor and what you do as a teacher. Um, again, I'm going to leave your information below. People can reach out directly to you. Uh, I, I want to say thanks again for your time. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the session with Edna, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions below. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you, Edna, so much for taking some time out of your day. Uh, stay warm out there in Saskatchewan because I know it's even colder there than it is here today. But uh, hopefully spring is around the corner and I think uh, things are about to change in, in everything in the landscape that we're about to do. I know it's been a tough uh, year for many of us uh, in in and outside of real estate investing. And so I wish you the best of success moving forward. And I hopefully I, I look forward to connecting with you in person at uh, one of our events in, in the very near future. Absolutely. And thanks so much for having me, Darren. It's my pleasure. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.